So um, let me see if I can make this work. Um, maybe if I do that. Yes, great. Okay, so the effect of this is a small effect. It's only about 6% uh, modulation. So what you see on the right is the Earth going around the sun. And then when you see uh, on your left is the actual spectrum that you would see depending on the time of the year. Now notice that the uh, difference in the rate is not continue is not uh, the same across all energies, right? So the rate goes up a lot around here. Uh, the the change is larger around here, and there's a node. Um, where it doesn't change at all, and then it actually changes in the opposite direction at lower thresholds. And this is a this is a target dependent curve. So you have to do this for the particular target because there's again kinematics and velocity. So if you look at that difference, if I only look at the residual modulation, I subtract the mean curve, um, I'll get something that looks like this. Right, so this green curve shows sort of the ma modulation amplitude that you would expect as a function of recoil energy, right? And we said that there was a node. There's that node right there, right? So at this at this energy, you wouldn't see any modulation, and then below that energy, you would see the modulation go down, and uh, above that energy, you would see the modulation go up, and you know, June, whatever that maximal energy is. And so this is for a germanium target in particular, okay? So for whatever target you have, you can look for this modulation, and not only are you just looking for a modulation of your signal, if you can have energy information, you would then look for this shape. And this would be a very telltale shape looking at something that, uh, that's very compatible with dark matter. Does that make sense? All right, so that's annual modulation. Another way you can do it is by looking at the direction of the recoil of your uh, event, and then you can do diurnal modulation, what's also called directional detection. So the idea here is that you know the wimps are always coming from the same direction, and if you have a detector placed somewhere on the Earth, as the Earth rotates, at some part of the day, the wimps are going to seem to be coming from the roof of your building. And at another part of the day, the wimps are going to seem to be coming from the side of the building. So as your building rotates around with the earth, if you can tell the recoil direction of the, m of the target atoms when they get hit by a, uh, by a dark matter particle, in principle, you would be able to see this change in direction on a day-to-day -day basis, and that would be another strong signal because it's very hard to make a laboratory-based background that would do this, that would change the direction that it's coming from on every day. Um, and so there's a, a couple of different technologies uh, that are being developed to do this type of directional detection. Um, if you, you know, some, some of the technologies have the ability to tell you um, which direction the, uh, the, the uh, event was coming in. So this is very similar to the stuff we were looking at with the uh, 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 block equation, uh, where you can see the peak of where the ddx is as a function of distance. And so you can see that it's stopping over here, so the direction is coming this way, and this is when it's stopping, it has a bigger ddx. Um, okay, so that's uh, uh, directional detection, and if we have time, we'll come back and show you a couple of the uh, experiments that are, that are working on this. The, the difficulty with directional detection is that you want to be able to see this, uh, this uh, motion, and you know, this is a, a CCD taking a picture of uh, ionization scintillation that happens inside of a gas. The problem is that if you have a solid, in a solid, the atom that gets hit moves a very, very small amount. But if you have a gas, which is uh, lower density, right, you can hit one of the gas molecules and that gas molecule can move 
of uh, you know up to like you know millimeters, and that gas as that molecule as it moves is whacking into other things and generating electrons, and so those electrons can then be sensed by either drifting them or you know making them scintillate or you know some other mechanism, so you can actually see that ionization. The problem with that is that as we've talked about. What are the things that we want on a dark matter detector? Well, in a dark matter detector, we want a large exposure. And if you have a gas, a gas have a really low density. So for these directional dark matter detectors, you're going to need a lot of volume to be able to uh, uh, have enough mass to compare to something like xenon where you know something this big is a ton of xenon is sort of this big right and if you're trying to make a ton of gas that's kind of a couple of rooms full of detectors so it's a very different uh, scale but this is sort of where we are right now so we say well what are the summary of, of what we want we want a large exposure um, we want if we can low energy threshold uh, we definitely want the lowest backgrounds and whatever discrimination between signal and backgrounds we can get, we will take. Okay? So now let's talk about um, actual technologies. This guy's not liking me too much. i got to be really close. Okay. So let's uh, talk about different um, technologies. Um, so the first thing I'm going to talk about is uh, sort of the, the uh, one of the uh, controversies on dark matter that has been going on for, for uh, many years, which is DAMA, right? So uh, this is what's called a model independent uh, signal. So we talked about this annual modulation and DAMA is an experiment which basically has sodium iodide crystals. These are crystals that will scintillate when energy is deposited into them. They have photomultiplier tubes, and they have a bunch of them. They have about 250 kilograms of, um, of sodium iodide inside a very radio-pure, temperature-controlled environment. And they just look at the rate of events. They count how many events do they get every day. And they also get some energy information. So they have a spectrum that they count every day. And then they've been doing this for a long, long time. Um, and what they see is that the rate, um, so the residual rate, when they take out the average rate of events that they get, modulates throughout the year. So this is the case where we're talking about where you, are, you have a background and you're using the modulation to subtract off the non-modulating background and see if you get an excess, which could be due to dark matter. And they clearly see a signal. Nobody is disputing that this is not a modulation. I think the, the, the current uh, combined data set is a 12.9 sigma detection of modulation. So I think nobody is claiming that this is not modulating. The question is, is it modulating because of dark matter? And so this is sort of their, their, um, their spectrum where they get uh, some rate that goes up Around here, these, these are probably due to potassium uh, lines. And they subtract out their average uh, rate, and they get this modulation. So um, the problem is that every model, so this is called the model independent search because they're not saying what dark matter is. They're just saying, I'm going to count, I'm going to subtract the residual, and I'm going to see if I see a modulation. If I see a modulation, this is consistent with what you expect. And the phase of this, the, the, the time of year that it peaks and, and, uh, and ebbs, does match fairly closely with what you would expect from the June-December uh, phase for dark matter. So why aren't we all celebrating that we have found dark matter well because as we were you you were talking about last year uh last week the the particle physics side of this is once you see a signal from dark matter you want to explain what it is right so you want to go from a model independent um experiment to a model dependent experiment you want to say okay well what is it let me come you know write down a lagrangian or a feynman diagram that describes the particle that is producing the signal and for you know, 20 years now, theorists have been writing papers 
trying to come up with a model of dark matter that will produce this signal and yet has not been seen in any of the other dark matter experiments. So any of the other dark matter experiments um, that have been looking for dark matter, we have not seen a signal that would be compatible with the, with the size of this modulation that Dama sees. So this is still an open question. I mean, we're, we could just not be, have been, uh, you know, uh, it is possible that we haven't looked at every single option and there's some, you know, model out there that hasn't been thought of that would explain why Dama sees this uh, um, modulation and, for example, xenon, which is a uh, xenon one ton, which is that right now the, the world's uh, biggest dark matter detector, does not see a signal. And it depends on the mass, and so peop people have been looking at this from all the different angles, um, but to date, we don't have a good explanation. So people have said, well, you know, it's an annual module, yeah? I'm going to get to that. All right. So, so you can say, well, you know, it's an annual modulation, right? You know, there's snow, there's, you know, the height of the atmosphere changes with the year, the water table changes with the year, the amount of radon in a cave changes with the year. You know, if you want to get something that changes, a year is a really good uh, it's a really good time scale for something to change. So people have been looking at every single possible background source that might modulate with the period of a year. Um, and there are lots of different papers on this. Um, and, and so this is a, a, uh, a slide from uh, Dama which shows you know, different sources that have been proposed. So maybe the radon is changing, or the temperature is changing, and thus the 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 um, maybe the threshold is changing. Maybe you have some noise that's changed with the year, or your energy scale. Maybe the efficiency changes throughout the year, um, or there are other backgrounds that we don't know about. Um, so there's a lot of different possibilities. Um, Dama has placed limits on the modulation rate for all of those, which are listed here. Again, this is their, uh, this is their uh, slide. And just for scale, the modulation amplitude of the signal that they see is about 10 to the minus 2. Counts per kilogram per, counts per day per kilogram per kV. And so you can see these are all uh, orders of magnitude below that modulation. So this is still an open question. And, and people have been trying for 20 years to reconcile the signal with all the other experiments that we will talk about. So the question that you asked was, well, I mean, isn't there another experiment that is doing the same uh, type of uh, detector to cooperate the signal? And, um, and that has been a, uh, that is an effort that is ongoing. There's some history before be, uh, with why that hasn't happened sooner, which I'm not gonna go into. Um, but right now there's actually a pretty active uh, effort to check since no, we have not been able to find uh, a, an explanation, the, the next thing to do is to say, well, let's do a second experiment that's as similar as possible and see if we see the same effect. And so there are different um, experiments that are being done right now with sodium iodide to try to do this. One of the interesting things is that if you can do this experiment in the southern hemisphere, the uh, yearly modulation effects that you would think about are going to be anti-correlated with the northern hemisphere background signals that modulate. Whereas the dark matter doesn't care whether you're in the northern hemisphere or the southern hemisphere because it, all it cares is where the earth is with respect to the sun. So this is a, a really excellent uh, idea to do a dark matter experiment in the southern hemisphere because it will definitely see a difference whether if they see a modulation and they see it in phase with the northern hemisphere, that's really strong evidence that it's dark matter. And if they see it with an anti-correlation, then that's really strong evidence that maybe we still don't understand what it is, but it's definitely a background. So there are a bunch of different experiments. The ones that are in the southern hemisphere is uh, DM-ICE, which is a proposed uh, experiment in Antarctica. 
and then uh, Sabre is uh, planning to do a um, ex uh, experiment in um, in Australia. So I'll talk. I'll show you a couple of these. So one of the experiments is cosine, and this is a collaboration between the Kim's experiment, which is a Korean uh, effort, and DM Ice, uh, which is an effort uh, run by uh, led by Reina um, at Yale, um, and they. They began taking data in September 2016. They have 100 kilograms of the same target material, the sodium iodide, um, with some tellurium uh, sprinkled in, and they're taking data right now. So this is in Korea. Um, then there is an effort led by the uh, by a Princeton group um, called Saber, and they have been working really hard. Um, on understanding how to make high purity sodium iodide because one of the problems be why hasn't been this been done before is because the making sodium iodide very pure is very hard and uh, people they just didn't know how to do it um, so these guys have done a lot of R&D to make sodium iodide as pure as they can to lower the backgrounds right we we're talking about if you're gonna subtract you're gonna look for a modulation and you're going to subtract some background, you want to that background to be as low as possible so that modulation is a significant fraction of your overall rate, right? The bigger the overall rate, the harder it's going to be to subtract that and not have systematics kill your experiment. And so you want to have the lowest background you can. So these guys have been working really hard on making the, the, uh, their uh, crystals very pure, um, also, they are surrounding their um, their crystals with a neutron uh, background, uh, neutron detector, to be able to um, to see whether any of the events that they're seeing are due to neutrons and not dark matter, and throw those out. Um, they have two uh, they have two locations. They're going to have a Saber North and a Saber South. Uh, Saber North is going to be uh, at uh, Gran Sasso and Sabre South is going to be in Australia. So this is going forward. And then lastly, there's the Anais experiment, uh, which is in uh, Canfranc in Spain, and they have 112 um, uh, kilograms, uh, which are uh, um, taking data. So there are three separate efforts. Um, and then finally, there's DMICE, which is, as I said, they've, they've joined forces with Cosine, but they're still um, interested in putting a bunch of sodium iodide detectors in the ice at the South Pole. They have one prototype that has been taken data and is still going, but that prototype is, you know, a prototype, it doesn't have enough mass to be able to make the measurement, not, not, a, not a low enough background. But if cosine goes well, they hope to then get the funds to actually then have basically a cosine south, which would be DMI in the South Pole. So the interesting thing is that this question, which is a, a, a huge question in the dark matter field, is being addressed. And you know, in the next year or two or three, we're going to start seeing results uh, from, all of from all these three experiments that are currently running. And we're going to either see a modulation which is consistent with what uh, Dama sees or not. And so that'll be very exciting, one way or the other, because uh, this is definitely one of the nagging questions. OK, any questions on that? All right, yeah? So the, the question is, what about the data from Dama, and have they released it? Dama has been very uh secretive about their data they have released some parts of it but not its entirety and that has been one of the things that has made it hard for people to check um and so you know this is a a, a separate uh discussion to have outside of of this uh venue on you know when you have a scientific experiment what data do you release and what data don't you release because it's not obvious that people will know how to uh process your data properly on the other hand, if you don't release it, then they can't reproduce your experiment. So, you know, it's a debate um, that has been going on. Okay, so this is kind of the model independent uh, dark matter searches. 
Then we have the model dependent, uh, which are the vast majority of the experiments out there, which basically say, well, I'm going to assume that there's some class of dark matter models, not exactly a particular dark matter model, but I have some class of dark matter models which will have some interaction with my detector, and I'm going, then to, going to then build a detector that will uh, be sensitive to those class of dark matter models. And um, as we're starting with WIMPs, we'll start, uh, we'll start here with WIMPs. Um, do you have another battery for this? It's blinking, blinking at me. Um, so. This is so, sort of the, the, the model dependent blame field. Let me see what, uh, it's two, looks like triple A's. Um, and so on the X axis, on the X axis we have the mass of the dark matter and on the Y axis we have the cross section to a nucleon in uh, centimeters squared and in picobarns. And so you can take your favorite theory and say, well, what are points in this playing field that are compatible with all known uh, data, you know, with uh, LHC data, with, uh, with uh, cosmology, with all of these things. You can then go and say, well, if I look at the, you know, constrained, minimal, supersymmetric models, any of these points here, these are old, so they're probably changed, but this is just to give you the flavor. Um, so this gives you a you know some parameter region where any of those points would still be compatible with dark matter um, and and is not ruled out and then you can say okay maybe i'll do the pmssm and i get some other points or i can do the next to minimal super uh um, super symmetric model which has more parameters so i can you know it, uh, I have a, a bigger playing field, or I can just forget about supersymmetry and say something like, well, what about asymmetric dark matter? Um, and asymmetric dark matter would be able to live uh, kind of here. I want to do that. Um, and so, you know, there basically the point of this is not to give you specific examples. It's just to say this entire region is available. Some, ex there will be some theory that will be able to tell you that, yes, in my theory, that particular cross-section and that mass is a viable dark matter candidate. And so what we do is we try to eat into this uh, uh, parameter space and what we have right now are limits. So our limits um, look something like that. So what this says is, um, all of this gray region is excluded. I basically say I have not seen an excess in my detector. If I had seen an excess, I would have seen n events, and I didn't. So my if if the cross section were you know 10 to the minus 42 and the mass were 100, I would have seen 100 events, and I didn't see 100 events. So the cross section must be less than that. And so you keep going down until you say, well, I, if the cross section were 100, if the mass were 100 and the cross section were 10 to the minus 46, I would have seen three events. And you know, three events is about where your 90% confidence level starts to kick in. And you say, okay, well, I can say to 90% confidence that the cross section of dark matter, if the mass is 100 GeV, has to be lower than 10 to the minus 46 because I statistically uh, can can discern between zero and three about at 90% level. Does that make sense? So that's how we make these uh, these uh, limit plots, and we do that for every single mass. Now, why do they go up? Does anybody know why they go up? At the at the right hand side, any ideas? It has to do with the with the plot that I showed you that had all the masses. And remember I had the, the neutron, the nuclear recoils? Be because when you go to this side, what happens? There's less, ma there's, there's less dark matter, right? When you go to the left, when you go to the right on this plot, there's the, we know the dark matter density, right? So there's less dark matter, so there's less uh, particles around, so you, uh, you uh, would expect less events, so you basically get a bigger uh, cross-section that you, can, you can't rule out this cross-section, whereas here you would have had more events and you can rule it out. What about on the left? Why do, why do these curves all curve up on the left? 
threshold. Exactly. So basically, on the left, you get to the point where either for kinematics or your detector can't see those uh, events, the lower masses are going to give you less energy. So if your detector isn't sensitive to those energies, you're going to start running out of efficiency. The efficiency to see those events goes down, and as your efficiency goes down, this limit goes back up. Okay? So that's why all of these curves have this sort of shape, like a Nike swish. Okay? So on the left is because we have less particles per for for uh, for a particular for the density that we have, and on the on the right and on the left is because of threshold. Okay. So the question, of course, is well, how far can we push? And we can't just keep going down forever because we're going to run into other things. And what we're going to run into is uh, the neutrino background. So uh, this is uh, a curve uh, that was done by my postdoc and my group a couple years ago, uh, which has been kind of called the neutrino floor. And what we've done is say, okay, well, what is if if I you know if if there are neutrinos going around and my detector starts to sense them, at what point would the sensitivity of my detector make me confuse the neutrinos I'm seeing with a particular dark matter? mass and cross-section. And I convert the neutrino flux into a, an equivalent dark matter signal. And then I can make this plot that tells me that basically, if I'm here, neutrinos are not going to be a dominant background. Whereas if I'm here, I am going to have to subtract my neutrino signal because the neutrino signal would be higher than the dark matter signal if dark matter had a mass of, you know, a, a 1,000, a 1 TeV and a cross section of 10 to the minus 49. So at that, at that cross section and that mass, um, neutrinos, uh, in this case atmospheric neutrinos, would be a higher signal in a detector that was capable of seeing that signal than dark matter. And so you'd have to subtract it out. Okay, and I'm gonna t we'll talk about the neutrino since this is a neutrino dark matter uh, conference. I'll devote a good section of one of the future lectures to how we make this this curve. Okay, so but we have basically this entire region, and so obviously we want to push down um, on uh, on the uh, left hand side and the right hand side. So we have this kind of natural division where we have this. Um, a high mass region, and then we have this low mass region. And this, this right here is, and again, we'll talk more about this later, this right here is the uh, boron-8 signal from solar neutrinos. And so the sun is basically all of this stuff is solar neutrinos. These are more atmospheric neutrinos. Um, and so you get this nice division between the two regions. Okay. So now I'm going to go into specific technologies that you can use to search for dark matter. So we'll start with uh, noble liquid detectors, uh, which we were talking about earlier today. So I will be able to skip some slides. Um, so a, no a noble liquid detector is going to look at the ionization and the scintillation um, of the uh, event. And we have uh, bunch of experiments that only look at scintillation and a bunch more that look at both scintillation and ionization to enable some discrimination. All right, so I'm going to go quickly over the principle because uh, Atori already uh, went through that. Um, so this is a, uh, a slide I got from uh, Raphael Lang, uh, who's on Xenon. And what this shows is a, a you know the, the kind of typical time projection chamber. There's liquid xenon. There's a, a a level where it stops, and then you have gas at the top. And there's a high voltage grid here and a cathode here. And so you have an event coming in, and when it hits, it generates some light, and it liber and uh, it ionizes some of the uh, xenon. Uh, atoms, so you have some free electrons and a bunch of light. That light gets collected mostly by the bottom PMTs, which are immersed in the liquid, and you get a blip on your PMTs, which is what they call the S1 signal. Now, because there's a field, these electrons drift, 
and the electrons then drift and get to this high voltage region. When they get to that high voltage region, they get ripped out of the, of the liquid and into the gas and they accelerate and they scintillate more. So they basically accelerate, whack into some of the atoms in the gas, ionize those guys, those electrons see the big field and start accelerating and whack into another gas molecule. And so you get a kind of an avalanche sort of uh, signal. And so you get uh, amplification. Um, and so that generates more light and you get a much bigger pulse um, when the electrons uh, cross that barrier, which is called the S2 signal. And this drift time is basically proportional to the z-axis of, uh, of the location of the event. And then the pattern in here gives you the xy. So this is a much, th that's kind of a cartoony version. Here's a much uh, nicer looking version of, this, uh, uh, of the event where you can see that you get a pattern in your uh, top PMTs, which gives you the xy location. And then this drift time gives you the Z component of the, of the event. And so you have this S1 and this S2. And as the Torah was saying, the ratio of these is different for nuclear recoils to electron recoils. So you can take one of these detectors and you can hit it with gammas and you get signals that look like this. So these two plots are the same. This is for Lux. Um, these are the same Y axes um, and the same X axes. But this is uh, photons uh, being irradiated into the system. And then this blue line is the mean of the photons. And then on the bottom, you have a neutron source being put into the system. And this blue line is the same blue line as up here. So this is the mean of the gamma uh, signal that you get. And what you're plotting here on the left is a ratio of this S2 to S1. And so you can see that the, all of the neutron, or most of the neutron events are below the mean, below the mean of this blue line. And this red line right here is the mean of the neutron line. So it's this red line right there. So if you just look at, th you throw away half of your neutrons, and you just look below the mean of the neutron line, you can see that you have a pretty clean region here where you don't get any gammas. And so you can use that to throw away all your gamma events. Right? That's your discrimination. Now, this is a very successful technology, so I, I have a little challenge for you guys. This is called Name Your TPC. Okay? And so I'm going to show you these... Uh, uh, show you these pictures, and I'm going to ask, you know, what are these experiments? See if you can call them out. It's not that easy, right? And that's for a reason. So these are not to scale, uh, but this is the RDM, which is a argon-based uh, experiment. This is xenon one ton, lux, and dark side, which is argon. Um, so these two are xenon, and as you can see, they're all very similar because this is the technology that, um, as Atora was saying, you know, has been developed for a long time and it works. So everybody is doing something very, very similar. There are, you know, minor technical differences in the design, but the basic technology works and is being used by everybody that's doing these uh, uh, noble liquid TPCs. Okay, so let's uh, talk about uh, some of the, some of these in detail. So the current um, uh, biggest experiment that is running is xenon one ton. This is a picture of their uh, uh, of their system. They have this big water tank, and I guess this is a a uh, a drawing of what's inside the water tank. You see the xenon uh, detector in here, and this is their huge uh, xenon purification and storage uh, facility right next to the uh, what right next to the water tank. Um, they have the best limit um, in, uh, in the high mass uh, dark matter searches right now. So what you would call the kind of standard WIMP. It's two tons of active volume of xenon. Um, and they, are, they have been running for uh, the, uh, about a ton year of exposure. Um, they are still uh, going to be doing some more running, but they are... 
um, planning to expand their experiment um, in a pretty good way where they're keeping the water tank, they're keeping a lot of the infrastructure, but they're just putting in a larger TPC. So um, they're already in the process of starting to build uh, Xenon Enton, um, which uh, is going to have a larger cryostat, um, it's going to have more PMTs um, and other improvements. They're, they're targeting about six tons and a sensitivity of 10 to the minus 48 uh, centimeters squared. So these guys are going to start to get close to closing up the neutrino floor. Um, they're going to have about an order of magnitude to go. And then after that, they're already talking, the Xenon collaboration is talking about a much bigger experiment, which is called Darwin, um, which is uh, 50 tons of liquid xenon, which are gajillion PMTs and, you know, bigger, more, everything growing in every direction. Um, and here are some simulations about on what they could do if they, uh, if these are like different models for dark matter, if they had, if dark matter were one of these X's, the blue lines are basically their uh, confidence intervals of what dark matter would be. And one interesting thing to, to note is that if you have dark matter that's light-ish, you know, in the 20, uh, 20 GeV-ish range, you can make a nice little circle around it. But notice that all of these higher mass guys, as they get down, they start to broaden out. You see that? Especially this guy has a nice big long fat line there. And that's because, um, remember when we we're talking about the rate equation for dark matter? It had a particle physics part, it had a nuclear physics part, and it had an astrophysics part. That nuclear physics part Remember, we were talking about the fact that xenon is a big molecule, a uh, big atom. When the dark matter comes in and hits it, as it gains more and more momentum, it'll start to see that it's not one big atom. It'll start to see the individual nucleons. And so that breaks down that A squared cross-section um, uh, that you get from having a large, uh, a large atom. So when you have light dark matter, the light dark matter doesn't hit it that hard because it's less massive. But when you have heavier dark matter, it whacks into the atom hard enough that it no longer sees it as one coherent thing. It actually starts to see that it is broken down into different nucleons. And that means that the response that you get is about the same independent of the mass. So whether you have a mass of you know 100 or 200 or 400 or 500 there is a uh the 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 nuclear structure term in your uh, equation starts to dominate the shape of the spectrum that you get and so you no longer can tell the difference in the spectrum between a 100 gev or a 500 gev particle and so that's why these things kind of grow. Um, when you get really low in cross-section, you don't have that many events. Basically, you get a degeneracy in the spectrum that you get because of this nuclear structure. Okay. So, uh, so that's uh, kind of the Xenon Collaborations Program. The Lux uh, experiment, which, uh, which uh, until Xenon came uh, with the results, had the world limit, is now building the... Lux Zeppelin LZ experiment, which is one of the um, G2, the uh, uh, United States uh, uh, second generation dark matter program experiments. Um, it has 10 tons of xenon, 7 tons active. So this is actually very similar to xenon N ton. Um, and they're building it right now. Um, and they're going to have a big. Uh, TPC surrounded by a neutron, uh, active neutron veto, and then uh, uh, more uh, active veto on the outside, which I believe is just water on the outside. So it's Cherenkov um, uh, active veto. And this guy um, is going to start taking data in 2019, so they're actively building, uh, building this experiment. So 
um, I think we will start seeing results from uh, uh, LZ in the 2020s, and those are going to very rapidly uh, improve on the limits um, that are out there today. Now, earlier today, you, you, ta you saw a talk about uh, dark side, so I'm not going to talk about dark side uh, very much. Um, I'll just say that um, the dark side 50 program was a, a kind of a, a first generation liquid argon TPC. They've now joined forces with the deep uh, experiment into this thing called the, I don't know how you're supposed to pronounce this, GAN? I, I don't know. You, you, yeah, somebody needs to sit down and come up with a better acronym for that. The Global Argon Dark Matter Collaboration. Um, and so they are going to, uh, they're going to build this uh, ginormous uh, uh, 50 ton argon uh, vessel. They're looking at both, uh, they're looking at this as both a dark matter um, detector and as part of the uh, dune uh, uh, prototypes. So that I think there's a lot of discussion in the general argon uh, community, TPC community of, of how to, to do this efficiently. Um, this was shown before, so I won't um, belabor it too much, just to say that ag apart from the S1, S2, argon gets this difference between the nuclear recoil and electron recoil, uh, guys. So you already saw this uh, with a Tori, so I won't stick too much to it. So they basically get two separate indicators of electron recoil to nuclear recoil. They get the S1, S2 ratio, and that difference in the pulse shape that they get from electron recoils and nuclear recoils. Now, finally, um, in liquid noble gases, um, there are some experiments that are not doing a TPC, and they're just doing a single um, a single phase noble liquid detector, which is essentially having a big ball of uh, liquid detectors, much more like the snow experiment that we saw earlier, um, where you just put uh, PMTs everywhere and then you try to get the location of the event by just um, looking at your PMTs and triangulating to where the event happened. And those are also uh, going forward, although I think the results from the TPCs have uh, been more positive and I think going forward the um, the collaborations are, are, are I think converging toward uh, TPZ des design so uh, this is sort of the 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 uh, uh, money plot for kind of the standard 100 GeV hopefully super symmetric uh, wimp which hasn't shown up yet either you know, supersymmetry in LHC or uh, in these dark matter searches, um, most of those models would predict that you would see something here. Now, of course, in supersymmetry, you could have dark matter that was in this mass range, but the cross section was down here. And, and, and it's not that hard to build a model that where the cross section is, you know, below the blackboard. And if that's the case, then we're never going to see it, which is one of the unsatisfactory things about uh, these dark matter searches is that we're not guaranteed that we're going to find it. And if we don't find it, it doesn't mean that it's not there. And so that's a, uh, you know, that so, so I always tell students that, you know, if you're going to uh, work in dark matter, you have to kind of be a poker player because, w you know, w when you're doing a dark matter search, you're kind of going all in. You know, you're if you if you find it, it'll be awesome, and but you have to be l willing to live with not finding it. And a lot of times, you know, the search is part of the uh, is part of the road, right? Like it's not the you're not trying to just get to that end. There's a lot of technology. There's a lot of analysis. There's a lot of work that goes into doing these experiments. So even if you end up with a limit and you don't find dark matter, there's a lot of good science that you do um, in in the meantime. Another good thing about that is that when you build a detector that's this big and this sensitive, it's not only a detector that can detect WIMPs. You can use it for lots of other things. So for example, people are thinking about doing uh, neutrinoless double beta decays with the LZ experiment. 
people are looking at axion searches with these uh, detectors. When you have something that big and that sensitive, there's lots of different ideas that you can come up with to use it in different ways that might not be the, the central science goal, but have other implications that for other types of dark matter or even other physics problems like neutrino list double beta decay that you can attack with that experiment. A good example of that is this low mass region, which we're going to spend some time talking about. Um, so uh, some of the people in the LUX collaboration just put out this paper where they're using the LUX detector. So this is not the LZ, this is LUX, which is um, uh, no longer the world uh, leading limit, but they have a lot of data and they've been using um, electron recoils and thinking about if I, if I have dark matter and it's light, it might hit the electrons in the xenon and that will produce some signal. And they've uh, been working with people that do modeling of uh, you know, electronic structure in xenon to come up with different scenarios. And so there's a, a something called a MIGDAL process um, for that enhances the cross-section for dark matter to uh, to uh, to electron scattering, and so if if you're looking at that, they can make a, a limit that's actually very competitive with the current world limits on crystal detectors, which we're going to talk about uh, next. Um, and then if you just think about Bremsstrahlung, uh, this is their limit using just the Bremsstrahlung process. So this is a very good example of how these detectors can be versatile. Um, and be used for different, in different types of analysis, um, even though that's not the intent of the, uh, of the experiment when it was originally built. Okay, any questions on liquid noble detectors before we move on? Okay, we're good? All right, so now we're gonna uh, start talking about um, uh, cryogenic crystal detectors. And I'm going to give you an overview today, and then later on, uh, I'm going to talk more about Super CDMS, which is the experiment that I work on, but I'm just going to give you the overview today. So in a cryogenic crystal detector, we want to look at the energy, uh, the heat deposited by the dark matter uh, particle, and we, can, we also can look at ionization, um, and some of the technologies also look at scintillation. So in this, uh, in this uh, region, we have uh, detectors that are not really, uh, uh, like Hori, that are not really used for dark matter. They're neutrino uh, experiments, but people have used them to make some limits on dark matter. Um, then there are the ones that do uh, particle identification, like CDMS and iDevice, where we look at the phonons and the ionization. Um, and then there are the ones that look at scintillation, which are uh, Rosebud and uh, right now very active Crest. Okay, so let's talk about the general principle of how these detectors work. So we talked already a lot about TPCs. We had a whole series of lectures on that. I'm not gonna go nearly into the same detail here in terms of the cryogenic detectors, just give you the simple idea of how this works. So you have a target or an absorber, uh, which is this blue thing like that right here and you put some thermometer on it and you connect it to a refrigerator which is at a very low temperature millikelvin thousands of a degree above absolute zero and you connect it with a weak thermal link what does a weak thermal link mean it means that this thing is able to change its temperature without uh um in with some time constant and then comes back to the refrigerator temperature right if you bolted it down to the refrigerator, it wouldn't be able to heat up at all. It would always stay at the refrigerator temperature. So you connect it to the refrigerator, but with a controlled thermal link that you engineer. So now you have a particle that comes by and whacks into your detector. It deposits some energy, but because of the weak thermal link, the detector cools back down to the refrigerator temperature. Does that make sense? So you look at that again, we go in, we heat the detector and then it cools back down. And so you get a temperature, since you have this thermometer, you get a temperature profile that looks something like that versus time. And the, um, the height of that uh, pulse, of that temperature pulse is proportional to the amount of energy that was deposited in the target. 
And so by looking at the height of these pulses, you can see individual events, and the height gives you the energy that was deposited in the target. So that's a very simple calorimeter principle. Now, you need a thermometer. So we used a transition edge sensor, and a transition edge sensor is a, uh, a superconducting film, and a superconductor is a material that will have zero resistance below some critical temperature, right? But in this case, um, so if you look at this curve here, the critical temperature is 100 millikelvin. So if you go above 100 millikelvin, this film will have a resistance of 10 milliohms. And if you go below the critical temperature, it'll go superconducting, it'll have zero resistance. But it turns out that these phase transitions are not absolutely sharp. There's some range in which it's actually inside of that phase transition between superconducting and normal. So if you run the detector on that edge of that transition, then you have one of the world's most sensitive thermometers because a very small change in temperature is going to move you in this curve and it's going to make a large change in your resistance. And so if you're measuring that resistance, that resistance is then a proxy for the temperature, which is a proxy for the energy deposited into the, into the crystal. And we read these things out with superconducting quantum interference devices. These are squids. Um, and uh, if, if one of you guys is interested in that, I'll well, I can talk about it more. I'm not going to delve into it a lot here. Okay, so this is Super CDMS. So this is an experiment that I work on. These are the three generations of Super CDMS experiments. We started off with uh, CDMS um, two, or CDMS one and two, which were um, three-inch diameter germanium discs. Um, about one centimeter thick, and we would have four sensors on the top and then charge sensors on the bottom. Uh, we then moved to Super CDMS Sudan, where we had uh, 2.5 centimeter thick detectors, and we then had four sensors, four different phonon sensors. You can kind of see that little triangular shape there. Um, and this, this is a mass that was designed by one of my grad students, Scott Hertel, who's now a professor at Amherst. Um, and we're going to talk about his work uh, further down the line. Um, and so now we have uh, four uh, phonon sensors on the top and four, four phonon sensors on the bottom. And we also have charge sensors on both sides. And then we go to Super CDMS uh, Snow Lab, which is the current generation that we're building right now, where we now have six phonon uh, sensors. We have a four-inch uh, diameter crystal. 3.3 uh, centimeters thick, and we also have um, two charge sensors on both sides. So we kept growing the detectors as we go. This is an experiment that um, each of these uh, crystals is basically the target we were just looking at, and then these thermometers are, instead of having just one thermometer, we have a bunch of thermometers, so not only can we measure the increase in temperature, we can actually measure where the event happened inside the crystal. And so we can do position corrections and position and fiducialization of the uh, events inside of the crystal. Uh, we're going to have an array of these guys, which are going to go into a cryostat. This cryostat has a whole bunch of shielding, as we were talking about before. We need a low background, so we have a neutron shield, the gamma shield, and another neutron shield. Um, we have a tower of these detectors. Each tower has six of those detectors inside. We're going to have four of those towers initially, although this cryostat is made to hold up to 33 uh, towers. Um, we'll have a dilution refrigerator that cools everything down to these you know, millikelvin temperatures. And then an uh, electronics uh, port that's going to go to this uh, uh, tank here that's going to have all of the electronics boards uh, coming out. And again, we'll talk more about... Um, about that in, uh, in a future talk. Um, so there are a couple of other groups that are doing very similar things. Uh, our European colleagues uh, are working on Eidelweiss. Um, and this is a very similar uh, technology. They're using, again, germanium detectors. They have a couple of different differences. You see that little chip there. Instead of, um, uh, they're not using transition ed sensors. They're using uh, uh, NT which are a semiconductor-based thermometer. 
um, and they glue it on the top of the crystal and they have all these rings that you can see there that create this very nice field and that this electric field allows them to um, to throw out surface events and this is a technology that we use as well in in some of our super CDMS um, detectors they're currently working on a uh, 32 gram smaller detector. So these guys were like 800 grams. They're now working on a small 32 gram detector that has um, uh, 18 EV baseline resolution. So this is a very low energy to uh, very low noise detector. And they're going to use that to uh, do uh, light dark matter searches in the future. Um, and this is sort of going in a direction where all of these crystal ex experiments are going, which is to go to very low thresholds so we can go to very light dark matter masses because as we talked about before, as you go to lighter and lighter masses, their, s their spectrum just kind of drops very rapidly. And in order to see them, you have to have a very low threshold. CREST has already been doing this. So CREST is an experiment that uses scintillation and heat so they have a crystal and this crystal has a thermometer on it this little red guy here and that measures the heat deposited into them but this crystal um, emits light when it gets whacked and then they have a second detector that's basically a silicon uh, chip or a silicon wafer with a thermometer on it and it will absorb the photons emitted by scintillated from this guy and heat this guy up. And so this one is basically just a light detector to detect the scintillation. Um, we, they don't use PMTs because this is all at millikelvin temperatures. So they use this secondary uh, guy as a light absorber that will absorb the uh, scintillation from this one. And so this, this secondary detector uh, is essentially measuring the scintillation from the primary detector. They have a very low noise uh, detector with 4.5 uh, EV a sigma of noise. And they uh, just um, uh, show showed some preliminary results in, um, in, a, um, in a dark matter conference um, uh, just a few weeks ago. Uh, where they're showing this this new uh, limit, which is very compatible with uh, this red guy, which is our uh, CDMS uh, limit, and this uh, purple one is News G, which is another technology. So as you can see, there um, uh, these crystal detectors are coming in and being able to look at uh, these low this low uh, uh, dark matter region. Um, so. We talked today about the liquid noble detectors, which really have um, uh, overtaken the field in terms of uh, good technology that's, w that's uh, looking for the kind of standard hot mass WIMP type dark matter particle. And they're going to continue doing that and hopefully cover the, s the, the parameter space, at least to the neutrino floor at the high mass. At the low mass, it's a very interesting region to be working on right now. So this is a zoom in of the plot that we were showing before, where instead of going to 10 TeV, I'm just going up to 10 GeV. So this is from 0.1 to 10 GeV. And this is a, the neutrino floor here. And this is just a zoom in of the current, the, the solid lines are the current limits. And then we have all of these predictions for different types of experiments. Some of them are crystal detectors. So this germanium high voltage is uh, super CDMS. So this is the uh, super CDMS prediction for our germanium high voltage detectors. This uh, guy here, silicon high voltage is our prediction for our silicon high voltage detectors. Um, DAMIC, which we will have a talk on uh, tomorrow. Or th yep. Um, we'll uh, has some predictions here. Idlewise also has predictions. We have other types of technologies such as News G, which is a gas, a cylindrical, spherical, uh, spherical gas uh, detector, um, and they have some um, they have some predictions of what they are going to do. And then there are other things like these uh, color centers, which are uh, new ideas for um, 
for looking for dark matter using different, you know, people are looking at, uh, at different ways of using molecular or, you know, you're talking out about 10 EV scales now, so you're going into the, the, the scale of molecular uh, excitations or dislocation excitations in a crystal. So a color center is basically when you get a, a dislocation um, in a crystal and that dislocation forms a lower energy state that can emit light uh, when it gets hit by something like 10 EV. And so you, you people are looking at different ways of uh, using um, either chemistry or, uh, or crystal structure or molecular excitations um, to be able to look for dark matter at these very low, low masses. And we'll talk a little bit more that about that um, as we go on. Okay, I think I'll stop here. Questions? Uh, about the CDMS detector, uh, is there a reason to for the configurations that you put in the phonons detectors? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm going to have a whole talk on Super CDMS. Um, um, what day is it today? Tuesday. Tuesday. On, on Thursday, I'll talk about Super CMS. So why don't you hold off that question? Definitely there's a reason why we have that particular pattern, and I'm going to talk a whole bunch more about how we design our detectors on Thursday. So I'll, I'll, I'll definitely answer your question, but let me uh, postpone it on thurs until Thursday, okay? All right. More questions? You you show us the another experiment the, that used the same te technology of the super CDMS, but it's smaller. When you shrink your, shrinks your experiment, you you get get a, a bet a best. I don't know. I forget the word. <laughs> uh, resolution. <laughs> yes, resolution on small scales, or sc scales of or mass. Yeah. So it's again. Um, it's always a trade-off. In order to get down here, you need to have a lot of target mass. And you need to have a very low background. In order to get over here, the threshold is m the most important thing. And notice that the, these are the existing limits. The existing limit over here is like orders, it's like way up there in the fourth floor or wherever. So if you're trying to look for dark matter in this region, you don't need to have sensitivity to 10 to the minus 42. If you have sensitivity to 10 to the minus 37, you're already doing good. And so there's a trade-off between building a detector that has a lot of mass so that you can get down here and a detector that's maybe smaller and doesn't have that much mass but has a lower threshold so you can go and look over here. And both of those things are being, as, and so what you're seeing with this, like for example, with this crest result and the um, Idlewise result, um, the crest detectors used to be much bigger and their uh, limits were like back here. Uh, but they said, okay, well, let's just build a really tiny detector and see what we can do. And they're already doing pretty good. Now, in order to go down, they're gonna need to build bigger detectors, build more of them, one of the problems with building small detectors is that you have your surface to volume ratio is not great, right? One of the things that's great about the Liquid Noble uh, TPCs is that they're large and they can make a fiducial cut where their center of their detector is this large amount of xenon that's away from any of the walls. And so all these surface events that happen at the walls, they just throw out. Now, if you have a really tiny detector, it's a lot harder to fiducialize, and so you have to take all of the events that happen in that detector, and that's a disadvantage, so you become background limited faster, but if you can make a small detector that has a very low threshold, even though you won't make a limit that's as low, you can still make a limit that goes to very low mass. And so that's the trade-off that people are making, 
and you know, we again, we don't know where dark matter is, so we will continue doing both things. If we start seeing a signal somewhere, then everybody is going to converge into that and then start to probe that area. And as Tali mentioned, uh, tomorrow there will be a talk on this uh, low threshold uh, detector. More questions? Uh, at low mass WIMPs, are there some uh, directional detectors that are... So, directional detectors are hard because, as we were talking about, you need to be able to see the uh, recoil. And so, they, are, they work best when you have a mass of dark matter that's the same mass as your target, right? For, for, for you guys probably know from kinematics, you can do that exercise. Like, what is the mass that's going to give you the biggest recoil when you hit two balls, you know, if you have two balls and you hit them together in an elastic collision, what's the, what's the ratio of the masses that will give you the best um, recoil of the second guy? It's when the masses are what? One much bigger than the other, one much smaller than the other. Think of like, uh, you know, pool. When you play pool and you hit your ball really nice, what does the cue do? Right? It stops and it gives all of the energy to the other ball. So when you're looking for directional detection, the ideal mass for a directional detector is a mass where the target is the same mass as the dark matter. So as you go to lighter and lighter, um, uh, masses, you get into the same problem, and now you're throwing ping pong balls at your bowling ball, and your bowling ball doesn't move very much. So looking at the direction of that bowling ball gets hard. Um, that doesn't mean that people aren't thinking about it. Uh, for example, this color center um, idea, which is a completely different um, idea of using dislocations in crystals that will yield uh, light when they get hit in s certain ways, those dislocations, because it's in a crystal, are directional, uh, have a, a directionality to them. They are more likely to emit light if they are hit from a particular crystal orientation. And so the color centers are a possibility for a dark matter detector that would both be able to see very light dark matter and be able to see a directional signal. So there's a couple of different ideas, a couple of different papers on using crystal structure to basically, you know, do, you know, people did x-ray diffraction, right, to, to understand crystal structure. So the same idea is you would use crystal structure to see the wimp wind because it's going to hit your crystal and it's going to have a different cross section as you move your crystal around. And so that's one of the ideas that people are thinking about is how can we use crystal structure as a directional detector. Okay, I think we have to go to lunch now. Uh, I'm hungry. Please, yes, you are or not? I am. Okay. <laughs> so please write down your questions and you, know, you can ask to Tali later and see you at 2.15. Thank you. Again.